In this temple in southern India, thousands of devotees are preparing to make a rather unusual offering. Some of them have waited years for this moment, growing their hair before giving it to the gods. It is a sacred ritual for millions of Hindus. My daughter was really sick. I vowed to donate my hair if she recovered. Do you know what will happen to your hair? No, I do not know, but it will be offered to the gods, and that's all that matters to me. Every Saturday, thousands of pilgrims come to the Dwarka Tirumala temple to be shaved by one of the 95 barbers that work here. The pilgrims leave behind kilos of hair. The temple has turned the pilgrims' offerings into an incredibly lucrative business. Once cut, the hair is collected and then stored by the temple. It is then exported around the world to be used in wigs and hair extensions. I don't know exactly what happens to the hair. The leaders of the temple take it and they sell it. For how much? Well, I know the temple makes about a million dollars per year. After it's collected at the temple, the hair is then transported to Ravindra Vanka's factory. Mix the hair and separate the dark strands. Every year, hundreds of tons of hair from several temples is treated here by the factory's 3,000 workers. The hair is washed, dried and then sorted. The factory stocks hair of every kind, color and form. For Ravindra Vanka, his products are a source of pride. You see? My God! <laughs> He's unbelievable. Yeah. How many inches is this? Yeah, it's 46. 46? Yeah. Wow! <laughs> I can't believe it. I've been working in this business for seven years, but this is the first time I've touched hair this long, more than a meter long. The price is $100 to $700 per kilo. It depends upon the length and what kind of the process. Bleaching, dyeing, blonde color. The blonde color more expensive. The factory attracts buyers from around the world and a growing number of clients are from China. Every year uh, almost a 10% increase. Why is so much increase? Well, because more and more ladies, they want to look younger, they want to look beautiful, so they, they need our products. <laughs> they love our products. <laughs> the Chinese alone buy nearly a thousand tons of hair from this factory. A business that just keeps on growing, much like the hair that sustains it. <laughs> right now, there is, as I've told you many times, and we'll repeat it again, there is a big, huge lie that's infected Am Israel, bigger than any disease that we've ever had. And that's the disease of falsehood being taught by leaders to tell people that they're doing a mitzvah when in reality they're doing an avira. Now, when it comes to wigs, this is not a problem for a small community. This is a problem for pretty much the entire religious Jewish world. A very small fraction of women, comparison, actually cover their head like they're supposed to, according to the majority of Puskim throughout all of history, with a hat or a scarf. Many women wear wigs. Now, there's been a debate about the issue of wigs for almost 400 years, which originally started, as we said in the past, by a misunderstanding by the Shitegi Burim, because all of the Chachamim went against it, of the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 64b, the Mishnah there, that talks about hair on the head and, and, and Pe'an Ochrit, which the Be'er Sheva went against, and so did many, many other of the Chachamim. Fast forward to not repeat some of the things we've mentioned in previous Shulim. Nonetheless, there are over 127 poskim throughout history that have said that wearing a wig is 100% asu. Why asu? It's asu, it's not allowed, it's forbidden, because it's not modest. It's not modest. Because the mitzvah of covering a woman's hair is an obligation. It's not like a chumrah. It's not a stringency. It's an obligation. It's an obligation of Shulchan Aruch. 
It's an obligation in the Zohar. It's an obligation in the five books of Moses, Parashat Sota. Or Naso, it starts, but that specific session is, is called Sota. It's an obligation in the Gemara, in several places. It's everywhere. Everyone knows that a Jewish woman must cover her hair. And for generation among generation, righteous Jewish women, all the, all the way back from the days of the Chumash, over 3,300 years ago, 4,000 years ago, covered the hair with the mitpachat. 5,000 years ago with the uh, Sarai Menu, covered the hair with mitpachat. But now, a few hundred years ago, things, certain things changed. So, the Machloket begins with this specific Mishnah, which says the following. A woman may go out on Shabbat with her hair braided with strands of hair, whether the strands are her own hair, or whether the strands are hair of her companion, or whether the strands are of an animal, with a frontlet, or with the head bangles, they are sewn to the hat, with an ornament, uh, with an ornamental wo uh, woolen cap, or with a wig into the courtyard. So this whole Gemara, and it continues, this whole Gemara talks about whether someone is allowed to put something on their head and walk outside when there's no Yehuv. Because in essence, it's carrying something. So is it considered carrying, or is it considered something like a piece of clothing which you're allowed to wear? So here it says there's a few different types of things. There is strands of hair, her hair, a friend's hair, an animal hair, or there's a, uh, a hat by itself, or there's a hat uh, with uh, bangles on it, or there is a um, wig, a wig itself. So here the Shil Tegimurim said, oh, see, there you go. Says that you're allowed to wear a wig on Shabbat. So it means you're allowed to wear a wig on Shabbat. It means you're allowed to wear a wig the rest of the week. But why did everybody go against what he said? He says, because you didn't read Rashi. You missed Rashi. What did Rashi say? Rashi said, first of all, who are these women that are putting strands of hair? Why are they just putting a strand of hair? Why did they put the whole wig? If you're already putting a wig, put a whole thing. Why are you putting strands of hair? First and foremost, you should know who's putting this hair. First off, some people get sick, they get bald spots. So it's embarrassing to have a bald spot. So put hair on it. Second thing, if you're going to uh, cover your hair anyway, with a mitpachet, with a scarf or a hat, why do you need to put the strands of hair? Because if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen a cancer patient, someone that's bald, and they cover their hair with a bandana, you know that they're bald. So many of the women, even if they cover their hair with a bandana and they really don't have hair, under it they still put a wig. Why? Because it still gives them more of a comfortable feeling, a comfortable look, to have that puffy hair look under the kisulosh. Even if it's Jew or non-Jew. So it says that even though, obviously all the women are covering their hair if they're married, so even if they're covering their hair, they're covering that bald spot with hair, not because you're going to see that hair, but rather because they don't want you to see that there's some type of hole there. Looks deformed. So what's the problem of just simply wearing the wig? What does what uh, Rashi say? He says, the wig is allowed, the wig is allowed because the only reason anything would not be allowed, for example, it's not allowed to wear certain ornaments on their head or certain things on their head, because of the fear that they'll take it off on Shabbat to show it to their friend, look how nice this crown is. Look how nice my crown is. And then forget to put it on their head and they're carrying it. And they're violating Shabbat. They're violating Shabbat because they're carrying something now. So there's certain things you're not allowed to wear specifically because a woman likes to show off her stuff. If it's really nice, she wants to show off a friend. Oh, look, I, my husband just got this for me. Look, my son just got this for me and so on and so forth. And now you're gonna forget to put it back to where it belongs. And you're going to carry it. And you're not allowed to carry it if there's no Yeruv. So he says, Rashi says, there's no problem with wearing the wig. 
Why? Why is there no problem with wearing a wig? Because there's no fear of a woman removing that wig. Why is there no fear of that woman removing the wig? Because the wig is sewn into the hat that she's wearing on top of the wig. The wig is sewn into the hat she's wearing. And of course she's not going to take off the hat because then you, she's going to be violating the Torah. She must cover her hair. So even if she wants to show somebody, hey, look at my nice wig, it's from France, it's from uh, Nigeria, it's from, I don't know, Brazil, wherever it is, she's not going to do it. Why? Because the wig is sewn to the hat. Because she has to have something to cover her hair. So she can't just take off the wig. She has to take off the hat. If she take off the hat, she's going to show off her head. She's going to show off her real hair. Not allowed. So here, all of the Chachamim, all of the ones that say it's Asul, it's not allowed to cover your hair with a simple wig. They're not using their own opinions. This is Gemara Meforeshet. This is what the Gemara says. Why is it not allowed to simply wear a wig by itself? Why is it not allowed? The Gemara specifically says in the same place, in 64b. Shevach Ula, because it will be considered an enhancement if an older woman is wearing the hair of a younger woman. Meaning, you're wearing hair that improves your looks, which is going to grab the attention of other people, which is an immodest act by definition. An older woman is not going to, you know, no older woman is, is getting a wig of white hair. If she's already going to wear a wig, she's going to wear a wig of a younger woman's hair. That is by definition not allowed. That's what the Gemara says. So when the Shitego Burim missed it, Kvodobim Komo, all of the other Chachamim said, you're 100% wrong, and that's why the overwhelming majority of Puskim throughout all of history I've said it's forbidden 100% to wear a wig. Over 117 post scheme said it already before recent history. Another 10 recently were added. But the recent 10 that were added were added for even another reason. The recent 10 that were added were added for a more significant reason. Why were they added? Because after an, in an intensive amount of studying that we've done, people in India, people in different markets, a lot of research that we did, and as you all know, I was on Wall Street for almost 20 years. That was my profession. That was what I did. That was my expertise. We pretty much have a, not like a opinion. It's a certainty. It's a market certainty. It's not my opinion. It's a market certainty. You go to any expert within the industry, real expert that's not biased, and you ask him, where does the hair of real hair wigs originate from for the majority of the market. Statistically, according to researchers beyond myself, over 90% of the hair in the world that goes for wigs comes from India. No other place. It does come from Cambodia and from China and from Russia and from different places, but it's small amounts in comparison to the large amounts. Why the small amounts? Why can't they just bring half of it from Russia? Why can't they bring half of it from China? Why can't they bring half of it from Brazil? Each one of those countries has its own explanation. First and foremost, Cambodia, it's very nice. Thank you very much for providing some of the hair. You just don't have a very big population though to provide a $10 billion business with hair. It's a $10 billion market. It's not like a $2 million business. It's a $10 billion industry. You cannot, Cambodia cannot provide even 5% of the market's hair. Finish Cambodia. Brazil, a lot of people say Brazil, comes from Brazil. I asked some Brazilians, oh, do you have people that donate hair and, or, or sell their hair in Brazil? They start laughing in my face. I said, well, okay, you don't have to laugh at me. Why? Why do why, why you think it's not, not funny? I'm not really doing research. Like, Brazilians and people from you know, this part of the world would be more likely to commit suicide from starvation, then shave their head. Such is the appreciation of, of personal beauty in that country, in that part of the world. So it's never happening. It's never happening. 
Brazil, gone. There are a few suppliers in Brazil, but after further research, we saw they were just smarter than everybody else. And already in the early uh, 80s and 1990s, they made contracts with the temples in India. A few of them made some big contracts with the temples in India, which we'll get to in a moment. Okay, Russia. Russia has this Shem el thing that they do where they go to the, the women prisons and they force the women, even if it requires physical beatings, to shave their head and then they sell the hair. This, how many, how many people in jail can you possibly have? It cannot supply a $10 billion business. I'm sorry. So then you say, okay, you have only left Europe. You go to Europe, France, England, Italy. You ask them, you guys shave your head, you see any bald people in the street? They're gonna laugh at you the same way they laughed at you in Brazil. It's, it's not happening. You don't see the Queen of England shaving their head to donate our hair anywhere. You don't see even the homeless people do such thing. It's just not part of their thing. And you don't see them selling it either. You don't see them selling it either. The reason why you don't see many people selling it, because you can get it for free. If someone sold it, if someone wanted to sell their hair, they'd sell it for a lot of money. No one in their right mind would sell long hair that took them 15, 20 years to grow. Well, no one in their right mind will sell it for 50 bucks. You're gonna sell it for several thousand. Why would I buy as a wig maker, as a supplier, why would I buy your hair for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars if I can get it for free? Meaning for pennies on a dollar, just go to India. So now you have yourself two main markets left. You have China and you have India. China gets hair from dead people. China has a population of a billion and a half people approximately. And when people die, part of the people actually they shave their head and they sell the hair. This is forbidden according to the Torah. You're not allowed to use the anything of the dead. So that I don't have to debate. It's a known fact, it's not allowed. But Chinese, you can tell it's Chinese here nonetheless. Either way, even if it is, even if it's not, it's forbidden. It's forbidden. But even more so, even more so, there's not as many people dying in China as there is people donating hair in India. Why India? Because India for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years has had it as part of their many religions to donate the hair to one of their false gods, to one of their idols. You have over a billion people live in India currently. Average, statistically, according to market research, not me, market research, professionals, experts, different major hedge funds, major uh, research houses, major business outlets, and so on, said average person has donated their hair at least two and a half times. Meaning two and a half billion. That's the market. There's no other country, including China, that can supply the market like this. Why? Because even if you got the hair from some European, or some Israeli, or some Cambodian, or some Chinese, or some, it still would be drastically more expensive. Why? Because someone's selling it. Here, the people are giving it for free and they're actually paying the temple to take the hair. No other market can compete with free. It's the best price. Now, why are they doing it for free? Because it is 100% idol worship. Just like Le'avdil, a million avdalot, big difference, we brought korbanot to Hashem in the Beit HaMikdash. They bring their hair to their false idols of rats and statues and all types of foolishness. Same thing in their eyes. Obviously stupidity, but nonetheless, their purpose is the same. According to the Gemara, Masechet Avodah Zarah, according to the Shulchan Aruch, according to the entire Torah, once something was used for idol worship, it can never be undone. That's why as soon as Yeshua ben Nun went into Amis, went to Eretz Yisrael, Hashem said, burn all the trees. Why burn the trees? What they do? Somebody worship them. Yeah, but the tree itself is innocent. It didn't do anything. It doesn't make a difference. It was used for idol worship once. 
it can never be used again. It must be destroyed. The only mitzvah left for its existence is to destroy it. It cannot be used. You can't make it into paper. You can't make it into tables. You can't make it used for beauty. You can't use its fruit. It must be destroyed. Meaning, if you have a wig and you have a zillion hairs in the wig and one hair in it, one hair came from idolatry. Just one hair, not the whole thing. One hair, but you don't know which hair. The whole wig has to be destroyed. Why? You can't take the chance. You can't take the chance that that one hair is on your head because that's idol worship. Now, all poskim, all Torah, all real scholars, all real Jews, everyone agrees you're not allowed to benefit from idol worship. Everyone. But there was some heretic that pretends to be a rabbi that came up and says, no, no, we're going to kosher the wigs. We're going to uh, oversee it. We're going to this, we're going to this, we're going to that. I already made enough videos about that, that the whole koshering of wigs is complete nonsense. There's no such thing. It cannot exist. There's no way to kosher it especially the way that he doesn't do what he, what he says that he does. And even he himself, when Rabbi Yashi Balav Shalom came out and said, it's not allowed, it's forbidden to use wigs from India or from anywhere from idol worship, he himself says, no, I don't, I don't agree with Rabbi Yashif. I don't think that uh, the idol worshiping is a problem. Even if you get it from India, you can still use it. So if you don't think that they need to be koshered, how are you koshering it? How many kosher institutions are there for wigs? One, only him. I made, a, I made already enough uh, comments about the whole koshering thing. What am I telling? What's the chidush here? Summarizing everything to a point. How is this connected to Yochevet, to Elisheva, to Dina, to, to, the, to the wife of, of El Azal? How is this connected? The main defendant, unfortunately, the main defendant of all of the wigs in the world right now, the main defendant of fighting for wigs right now, the main, unfortunately, the main defendant of it is Chabad. Chabad stands for Chokhmah Bina Badat, three levels of, of wisdom. Unfortunately, today, after the Rebbe died, it stands for three other things. It stands for, you have to believe that the Rebbe is Mashiach, Stands for that all Everybody is a uh, captured baby. You're okay wherever you are. And stands for wigs. You go to Chabadniks and you tell them, listen, it's forbidden. Over 120 poskim said that it's not allowed. They say, no, 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 Rabbi allowed it. You tell them it's forbidden. It's idol worship. All Puskim says it's not allowed, including the, 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 the Rebbe. Of course the Rebbe would never say that idol worship was allowed. It's against the Torah. It was a Kadosh. It was Ish Kadosh. Not allowed to idol worship. No, no, it's not idol worship. What do you mean? I told you it's idol worship. The idol worshiper himself made a video saying it's idol worship. I have people in India, in India, saying it's idol worship. We do idol worship. Yeah, sure. What's the problem? They, have nothing, they don't think there's anything wrong with it. Mm. They're not embarrassed of their idol worship. They're proud of it. You know how many videos I have of, of people saying it's idol worship? Mm -hmm. While they're shaving their head. Mm -hmm. They're proud of it. Just like you're proud of putting feeling on your head. Just like your, 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 your wife is proud of putting a, a scarf on their head. Just like you're proud of saying Shema Yisrael. Just like you're proud of eating kosher food. Just like you're proud of sending your kids to yeshiva. They're proud of their idol worship. So they made many videos there. There's no problem. They're actually looking at you like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you, why don't you also pray to the rats? And the bats and the, and the snakes and the, and the statues with the, uh, with the elephant head. Why, why don't you pray to them too? They don't know what's wrong with you. They don't realize what's wrong with them. So you tell the Chabad, no, no, it's idol worship. No, no, the Rebbe allowed it. The Rebbe allowed it. There's no way the Rebbe would be allowed. Would, would, would make a mistake. What, is he God? And for the last couple of days, I've had this for months already, for the last two days I've been debating, Rabbi Ephraim and I have been debating these several, several Chabad rabbis. Where they're literally, it started as, we just posted something about uh, some person had a dream that the Rebbe, Lubavitcher Rebbe, Allah Shalom, came to him in a dream, or came to her in a dream, and said, I never said that wigs are, the wigs of today are allowed. They never said that I'm a Shia. Tell people to stop. Tell people to stop doing it. Stop saying that this is my name. I posted this in this of different groups. Immediately, these uh, first rabbi, 
It publicly insults me, says you have to be an idiot to believe such a thing. And you're a fool, and you're this, and you're that. A lot of compliments. Thank you very much. Oh, Hashem. I need a schuyot in Shemaim. Thank you very much for helping me out. Fine. So then we started talking about, I said, well, wigs are not allowed. And like, no, but the Rebbe allowed, and we have other proofs, and we start going back and forth. So initially they provide five sources of poskin. We the sources it's all mistake. You just don't know how to read these people. We provide them 25 sources, showing them that the five sources are wrong. They provide two or three more sources. We provide 50 more. 50 more. So far, we're, we're outnumbering a little bit. 50 more, not allowed. What do they do? They start cursing us out. Start insulting us. We continue. For the Amet, there's proofs. Then we say, even the Rebbe, Lovavitch, the Rebbe himself did not agree with what you're saying. Why? What did the guy say? The rabbi, the Chabad rabbi, what does he say? He says, yeah, yeah, I just came back from uh, such and such town in Israel, and I was making sure to look at all of the women to make sure they're wearing wigs. <laughs> Wait, excuse me? What did you just say? I what, said, what did you just say? Yeah, I made sure to look. This is in writing. I can show it to you. It's in Hebrew, though, but I can show it to you. I'll make sure to look at all of the rabbis and all of the women to make sure they're wearing wigs. Why are you looking at women? You sote. Why are you looking at other women? You don't know, you don't know you're, supposed, you're obligated to watch your eyes? And then they start creating laws and they start creating things in the name of the Rebbe. The Lubavitcher Rebbe that was an Ish Kodesh. They start creating things. What they say? The Lubavitcher Rebbe refused to marry any couple if the woman did not agree to wear a wig. Are you stupid? Are you, are you, is something wrong with you? Where did you come up with such nonsense? We start providing them proofs that the Rebbe himself himself wrote letters for mitpachat, for the scarves. And this goes back and forth, back and forth, not so much them, it's more cursing, us, it's more proofs. Nonetheless, we're trying to get to the emet. We're trying for shaman. We're figuring it's frustration. We're not taking anything personally. Whatever, it is what it is. You get a little heated sometimes. Fine, you want to get heated. Fine, no problem. So then, Mama Siat Dishmaya. After Siat Dishmaya, after two days of arguing, I've been dealing with this weak thing for a couple of years already. Robert Frank for even more. He wrote it in his books and so on. I have Siat Dishmaya of a lifetime. I think to myself, all this debate, pa, 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 pa. who was the closest person to the Rebbe? Who is the closest person to any Ish Kodesh? Who? Of course, Rabbi isn't close, Chavuta is close, but aside from that, the Cheder Chadarim, inside the room, who? His wife. What did his wife do? His wife definitely didn't call him a Shiach, I can tell you that. But what did his wife do? Went on on some research. I found you some confirmations. I found you some confirmations. You can't say it's my opinion. Why? The source is Chabad. The source of everything I have right now is Chabad. It's not me. It's not, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't go back 30 years in time to take these pictures. Chabad has several movies about the Rebetzin. She was a Ishak Dosha. She was Mamash in our generation. When she lived, she died in the late 80s. The Rebetzin was Chaya Mushka Schneerson. Was Mamash Ishak Dosha. Unfortunately, didn't have any kids. But when there was a lawsuit and they were looking at the estate, they were looking into the the state of Chabad, and so on and so forth. And they asked about the Rebbe, and they asked about her, her father, which was the, uh, the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe before the Rabbi Schneerson. And they uh, asked, uh, oh, what does he have? What does he have? He goes, no, no. The Rebbe belongs to the Hasidim. Everything he has is for the Hasidim. Everything. There's no purse, our house, our car, our money, our bank. Everything is for the Hasidim. One little boy came to the Rebetzin. He says, Rebetzin, where are your kids? 
The little kid doesn't know miskin what having kids is. Miskin doesn't know. Innocent, innocent. Mama's pure soul. What the rabbits instead of crying like all of us want to cry right now for such a thing? What did she say? She says, all the Hasidim are his kids. All the Hasidim are our kids. Say Isha Kedusha. I want to know what Isha Kedusha in our generation did. If you're saying so many things about her husband, I love a shalom. I want to see what she did. She go with her husband. She go again. to what she do? If she's a Kedusha, I want to be like her. Abutai, you don't need to listen to my words anymore. You can just see pictures. Here's the first picture. This is a very famous picture of the rabbits in Snearson. You see that there is a little bit of hair and a hat. There's a little bit of hair and a hat. Now this is obviously, for anyone, any woman would tell you this is obviously her real hair. We showed this to the Chabad rabbis. They said, no, no, it's a wig. It's a wig. I said, okay, let's check another one. Let's check another picture. We have another picture. What about this one? It's another hat. This is a wig too? From 80 years ago? It's a wig? Oh no, it's a wig, it's a wig. Hashem, Hashem have mercy on you, he tells me. Hashem have mercy on you for calling, for thinking this is not a wig. Hashem have mercy on you. I said, okay, fine, no problem. No problem, this is a wig. This is her, by the way. I said, okay, no problem. Let's see, next, next, next picture. Here she is, over here. Same picture as the other one, just the original picture. This is a wig? Oh no, it's a wig. I shouldn't have mercy on you. It says it's a wig. It's, I said, okay, no problem. Fine, no problem. We have wigs. We have a lot of wigs. We have a lot of different types of wigs. Then you have the movie. The movie uh, called The um, Life and Times of the Rebbitson. Life and Times of the Rebbitson. The, a brief biography of Rebbitson Chaya Mushka Schneerson. It shows several pictures of her. Some of that I showed you, some that aren't. This is one of them. This is one of them. And you see that there, this is her. You see that there's hair here in the back. And there is a hat. There's a hat. Okay? And, okay, let's say this is also, I made it up, I don't know, somehow, or whatever it is, fine, no problem. Now, oh, so, so you know, the halakha is that you are allowed to show, according to halakha, you are allowed to show up to three fingerfuls of hair. Up to three fingerfuls of hair you're allowed to show, front or back or so on. Chabad claims, today's Chabad, not Lubavitch Rebbe, today's people claim no no we hold by the Zohar who says you're not allowed to show even a single hair not even all the show that's why the wig is better according to them and to actually wear a mitpachat is a sin according to these rabbis that I had a debate with it's a sin Shem Elachem if that's a sin what's a mitzvah mm -hmm. anyway so they said that's why so I said okay so what about the Rebetzin she's showing some hair no that's a wig that's a wig okay fine it's a wig so let's just go fast forward and we go to 1985 just a couple of years before she died and we see what the Rebbitzin is wearing next to a, a man that's not a husband. This is actually a picture that was taken when they were questioning her to some type of a, a financial issues, some type of lawsuit. And you see, you can't see in the back digitally, but over here she's actually wearing a kisui rosh. She's wearing a, a, some type of a cover on her hair. And the front is showing. About three fingerfuls or even a little bit more of three fingerfuls is showing. Next to a strange man, obviously a cameraman. So obviously she's, this is not a picture that somebody got behind the scenes and she didn't know because if she knows that there's people out there, she's a she has to cover her hair. Now, if in case this was not convincing, let's go, there's another version of the picture. Now she looks and you can see clearly that she has something covering her hair. And a little bit is not covered in the front next to the same strange man, whoever this tzaddik is. 1985 gives you the date and everything. And if that wasn't enough, I told them all, oh, what about this? Like, no, no, it's a wig. I'm like, what a wig? An old woman is going to get white hair wig? And he said, no, no, it's not, a, it's not. If it's not, that's only because she's home. So she doesn't have to cover her hair. I'm like, what do you mean she doesn't have to cover her hair? There's strange people next to her, not her husband. Did you just create a new law? He said, don't make fun of me. This is what he's responsible. Don't make fun of me. So then we have another picture of the Rebbitzin of her in a car. This is a, somebody took, she was in a car, and actually you can't see it here, but she's actually wearing the same exact kisu as before, and the front is showing, but she's in a car. So you can't use that excuse of she was home, and she didn't know, and she doesn't have to. Meaning every single argument you have is going to the garbage. She wore kisu rosh. And last but not least is another one where she covered her hair, here she doesn't have much showing at all. Uh, she covered our entire hair. It's a black and white picture. 
So now you have Isha Kedusha that dedicated her life to Chabad, dedicated her life to her husband, dedicated her life to Hashem Barach. What did she do? She put a mitpachat on. Now, if that wasn't enough, I figured, Shtabach I already have said Nishmaya, let's go all the way. Hashem, what did his mother do? Guy's not going to go against his mother. You know, his mother was Tzadikah Kedusha. What's the story about his mother? His father was a huge, huge Tamit Chacham. One day, the, the communists wanted to kill them. Wanted to kill them nonstop. But the father, his father, I remember this story from years ago. His father used to write Chidushim on the corners of the Gemara pages. Because they didn't have money for, didn't have money for, uh, for paper. Or very, you know how expensive paper was back then? Like today, you buy uh, 500 pieces of paper for $2. Back then, you have 500 pieces of paper, you're already rich. So the people used to write chidushim on the corners, you know, between, you know, you have the book, you have the book, and then you have a little bit of uh, white space on it. A little white space, that's where they write the chidushim, on the corners over here. So she took all of these chidushim, all of the books, instead of clothes, instead of food, instead of money, she took all of his chidushim and she took it out of the country to save the books. She put her life on her line. No money, no clothes, no nothing. She just took his books. Why? The world must see his chidushim. This is how much she loved Torah. This is an Hashim Ketushim. It's not regular women. It's no different than the, in that generation. No different than Yochevet and any Sheva. It's no different. What did she do? Rebetzin Schneerson. Chana Schneerson. Look at this. Nice hat. Look at this. Another hat. Some hair showing on the side. But you have the hat. More hair showing than the rabbit's in. Other one. But nonetheless, there's a hair covering. Which we'll explain in a moment. Another one. These are all the pictures that are available. There are no more pictures. You want to go find one? Send it to me. But I, don't, I didn't find it. I did a lot of research. Baruch Hashem. Covering more. This is a meeting. First meeting she had with the Rebbe himself. She hasn't seen him in almost 20 years. Meeting with all the rabbis and the Rebbe. Rebbe here, as you can see, is very young. This is the Rebbe, it's in his mother. The hat looks like a strimal. She covers everything. Huge. And again, another meeting over here, another black and white picture. This is the Rebbe, in here. This is the Rebbe. Again, a huge hat. And if you want to read, you should read the story, the life and times of the Rebbe, it's in Chaya Mushka Schneerson. It's actually on Chabad's website. It's actually on Rebbe.org or something like that. Very, very good article. Also has many of the same pictures that I just showed you uh, and others. Uh, not others. And uh, what's it called? Just in, in the article. Now, what's the point? The point is, I'll tell you a few things. Number one, even if you want to say, which is a lie, even if you want to say they wore both of them, both of these tzedikot kedoshot wore a wig. Let's say they did. They didn't. But let's say they did. What kind, what kind of wig did they, did they wear? What did they wear? They wore exactly what the Gemara says. Exactly what Rashi says. They wore the wig under the hat. Okay, I wore the wig. White wig. Okay, fine. Never really existed. Why? No, no problem. I wore the wig under the hat though. Not a wig by itself. Not a wig by itself. Covered my hair. Obligate. No problem. But just like Rashi says, just like the Gemara says, just like the Mishnah says, no three feet long wig reach the floor, not even a short wig. Nothing. Why? It's not allowed. It's Pashut not allowed. It's Pashut not allowed. So even if it was a wig, you see it's covered by a hat. In reality, it wasn't a wig. But you want to believe it's a wig? Fine. Okay. If you're holding by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, you want to hold by him to wear a wig? No problem. At least hold by what he actually did. Don't hold by something you created out of your thin mind of what you say he did. Hold by what his wife did. Hold by what his mother did. No problem. But don't go out and pretend like you're covering your hair like the Baba Sali says. He says these women... They, they're, 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 they're pretending like they could fool God. They're pretending like they could fool God by fulfilling the obligation of covering hair with hair. 
They're pretending to fulfill the obligation. You think you can fool Hashem? It's nonsense. It's nonsense, Rabotai. You have to understand. To be a Isha Kedusha is not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. To bring Amisa to a point where Hashem will save us out of the Tum'ah of the world, out of the impurity of the world of Egypt, it's not easy. You fast forward 3,300 years, we're in the same situation. For any woman to do serious tshuva and stop with the nonsense, it's not easy. But at least don't lie about it. Don't pretend like you're finished with your tshuva. Don't pretend. We have all a lot to do. We all have a lot to do, but knowing the truth is half the battle. Knowing the truth is half the battle. That's what we can do, tshuva. You want to hold by Rebbe? No problem. Do what he did. You want to hold by Rabbi Vadya? Do what he did. Whatever you, whatever you want to hold by, do what they do. Don't start creating new rules in someone's name that died and you can't ask them now. The best part is they said, no, Rav Kanievsky said it's allowed. I said, no way, he didn't say it's allowed. I have a video of him saying it's not allowed. A video right now. He just made it a few months ago, a couple years ago. A hey, video of him saying it's not allowed. They showed him a 15-year-old wig, meaning it's a wig that's been beat up. He says, this looks like real hair. It's not allowed. No. Why would they insist so much in that it's allowed? Why they insist that it's allowed? Because the guys don't know how to watch their eyes. That's the truth. The guys don't know how to watch their eyes. They want to be like Goim. They want their wives to look like Goim. They want to make the same mistakes Dina made in the parasha. Dina made a mistake she wanted to see. She didn't want to be like the Goim. She wanted to see. The guys today, they want to see what the Goim look like. Oh, look, they have long hair. I want long hair. That's the truth. That's the hard truth. That's what they're going to try to hang me on. That's what they're going to try to fight me with. It's no problem. Mila Hashem Elai. I'm for God, whoever wants to fight, good luck. Well, maybe they own interest. Whatever it, of course, is interest is money, but in reality, it's eyes. In reality, it's eyes. Yeah, of course, there's money. Yes, of course, at the end of the day, to do tshuva for such a thing, don't take it for granted. It's very difficult. Mm. Why is it very difficult for all of them to do tshuva? Mm. Just like Rav Sadia Gaon said. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the embarrassment is so big, I'd rather the person die than me go visit them in the hospital. Sometimes it's so hard for them to do tshuva, they'd rather die, themselves even, mm. than, than put a uh, kisu roshan. But that's the difference between a tzaddik and a rasha. That's the difference between a tzaddiket and a rashait. You want to bring the Mashiach for real? You will say, Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. You say, want to bring the Mashiach? Okay, bring the Mashiach. Do tshuva. Mm. Do tshuva. It's not easy. It's not easy. But you can do it. If you couldn't do it, Hashem would have never given you would have never given you this test. And that's what we'll finish with. The Pele Yoetz, Allah Shalom, says in Chesed La'alafim, nearly all of a woman's reward and punishment in this world and the world to come. All the reward, all of the punishment comes and is dependent on her modesty. It's the Pele Yoeh, it's not me. You have a problem? Go to him. He's in Olam Abba right now with the rest of Chachamim, Rabbi Akiva. Oh. You have a problem? Go to him. That's the truth. At least we know where we stand. It's nothing chas v'shalom against Chabad. It's nothing chas v'shalom against anyone. It's only against lies. It's only against lies. There's many Chabadniks that I say stories on in the Shurim that are Kodesh Kodeshim, whether it's Rav Zilber or the Rogochover and many others. And the Lubavit Jerebi himself. But enough's enough. Stop desecrating Hashem's name. Stop desecrating even your own Rebbe's name. Saying things in his name. Come on, no, enough. Enough. Let Am Yisrael do tshuva. We all need to do tshuva. That's what the Rambam says, which Chabad teaches. They have a, a way, a structured study for, 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 for a Rambam, where they finish the Rambam mm. each year, I believe. And Mamash, it's, it's, there's a seder, they, they hold by it. So, okay, hold by everything he says. Hold by everything he says. Don't just pick and choose. We're not Christians. Mm. This will 
Shock enough people into tshuva. Not into war with me. It's not me. It has nothing to do with me. If one thing that I said is a lie, prove it. If one thing that I said is a lie, prove it. If one thing that I said has a bias, that I have some personal interest, prove it. If you can prove it, I'll admit it openly. I'll make a bigger lecture about it. I'll make a bigger lecture. I have no problem. It's not, it has no, no benefit. If I, if I said something wrong, if I said some mistake, I'll admit it. If I have a, a, some vested interest in it, I'll admit it. But the onus is on Ami Slay, the onus is on everyone. Face reality. Okay, this is where you stand, now what? You want Hashem to answer your prayers? Now what? It's time to do tshuva, Rabotai. It's time to do tshuva. Yes. Listen, we learned from Parashat Vayera, and we're going to learn next week Parashat Bo. Hashem put the plagues on in order to show us the measure for measure punishment against the wicked. Chas v'shalom for us to be judged as the wicked. Chas v'shalom. We want to be the righteous. They're in between the lines. We want to be like Yochevet. We want to be like Elisheva. We want to be even like Dina. We want to be. Alvai is, is, is one of them. Alvai. We don't want to be like Paul. We have to, we have to stop sinning. Just like it said at the end of the parasha, even though after Hashem rebuked him so many times, seven times he beat him on the head so far, and Paro continued to sin. Chas v'shalom, we continue to sin. Chas v'shalom, we continue to sin and think that what we're doing is a mitzvah.